views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Public Health America, a 30-minute program on BronxNet where we talk with national experts to promote health and social justice. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We begin by focusing on a current health topic from the COVID pandemic to cardiovascular disease. Our goal is to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. On Public Health America, we also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings and opportunity, and champion the ability to engage in civil debate. But for many, finding a path to college is neither clear nor certain. What if you're a high school student with supportive parents but feel daunted by the prospect of being the first in your family to attend college? What if you're a single mother or father and want to attend college but have no childcare? On Public Health America, our expert will also talk about decisions they made and support they received that helped them beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. I am so pleased to have Dr. Anna Berstein join our program. Anna is an assistant professor of population health at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She completed her doctorate at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and is an expert mathematical modeler, also an expert in the epidemiology of COVID-19 and has been doing some really cutting edge work at NYU that has informed public policy with respect to COVID, among other things. Uh, Anna, welcome to our program. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Dr. Latimer. Thank you. And let's, um, if it's okay, please call me Bill. And if it's okay, I will call you Anna. Is that okay? Sounds good. All right, wonderful. So, you know, we obviously we've been with this terrible pandemic for well over a year. We're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. That's great. And obviously, you know, you can't listen to a news story without getting uh, case rates, incidents, prevalence, death rate, et cetera. Let's go back. Where did this come from? Where, how did humans end up with COVID-19? Sure. Well, uh, originally this virus, SARS coronavirus 2, came from bats and then it probably hopped through some animal hosts. Um, it's not sure exactly what pathway it took to get into humans, but it traversed some path from animals to humans. And we know that because we can look at the virus's genetic code. And so we know the virus was not man-made in any way. It wasn't bioterrorism. And there's no sign that it has ever been in humans before. And indeed, the more we look, the more we realize that dangerous viruses jump from animals into people all the time. It's just really a roll of the dice every time about whether one of those events might start a pandemic. Now, one virus that, that does this all the time is called MERS, and that virus um, is much more deadly than COVID than uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, uh, but it has jumped from camels to humans in the Middle East many times, and it just happens to not be as transmissible in humans, so it hasn't started a pandemic yet. Because we have known about that virus, and as well as the first SARS virus, we actually got a bit of a head start on making vaccines and therapies against the virus that we got, even though it was a new virus, it was a relative of ones that have jumped into humans before. Another virus that jumps into humans is a type of influenza virus that could start a flu pandemic, potentially. And really, it's a reminder that we have to get prepared because these jumps happen all the time. And it, it's just a, a roll of the dice about whether one is contagious enough to start a human pandemic. So you mentioned, that's very helpful, you mentioned that these jumps happen all the time and we don't know precisely how the jump is made. But and forgive if this is too simple a question, but what is the jump? Like literally how does it get from an animal to a human? I'm, I'm not saying we know how it happened in, with COVID-19, but how can it happen? 
Sure, it can happen a number of ways. Um, so we know, for example, with the HIV AIDS virus, that's a virus where we have a little bit of a better idea that it, it happens from contact with blood or bodily fluids. And it likely happened because people who are living in a jungle area had contact with a primate, a, a monkey, um, either through eating or hunting or some kind of encounter like that. With the first SARS virus, we actually know a lot. We know that that virus jumped from animal to animal to animal, um, exotic animals like the civet cat mutating all along the way until it jumped into people and that that happened in the context of a wet market. And with SARS coronavirus too, we're still figuring it out. It's such a new virus. Um, it, the virus emerged in an area that had a wet market. It also had a laboratory that studied similar viruses. So I think right now people are trying to understand, was it an accidental lab release or was it um, exposure to animals in the wet market, which th that second mechanism we know can happen because it's happened with a very, very similar virus before. Um, but whatever it is, it's it's some way of the, the fluids, the, uh, you know, uh, some part of the body of an animal, um, often a wild animal, but also sometimes animals that we cultivate for agriculture, um, getting into a human. Uh, earlier this year, we were all told, if you keep a backyard chicken, don't kiss your chicken because of salmonella. So that, that's a reminder that, that you know, the animals that we keep, um, that we cultivate for food, for example, can be another source of pandemic viruses. Not it, not it. Remember, you heard it here, folks. Don't kiss your chicken. Okay. Um, very helpful. Let me ask you this now. Let's turn to policy. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you use, you know, NYU is great and you're part of the team that's leading the charge using mathematical modeling of the progression of the pandemic, at least within the U.S. and perhaps beyond, to inform public policy. If you can, maybe give us sort of a thumbnail sketch of what mathemat mathematical modeling is and then how you're using that to inform policy? Sure, so a mathematical model, well, a model in general is any time when you have some kind of system and you're trying to find a way to represent it, to think about it. So that there are conceptual models where you just think, well, in general, you know, this system has these parts. And then a mathematical model is when you get really specific and you actually write down the equation for exactly how you're representing this system, how you think the system works. And so in our case, our model included the fact that we have New York City with people in it. People have different ages that, that might make them more or less likely to have COVID-19. They live in different neighborhoods. Um, and, and then we have this virus that infects people. And so people can be infected and infecting others, or they can have immunity from infection, or they can have immunity from the vaccine. So we, we wrote that all down as equations and we implemented it in a computer so that we could run the model. And th the purpose of that was in order to be able to answer uh, questions from policymakers. So questions like, um, should we uh, prioritize vac vaccination um, really specifically to the people who are most likely to get sick? even if that slows us down a little bit because we're gonna ask people to you know, show ID or prove that they're eligible, or should we just have a free for all just so we can vaccinate as fast as possible? You know, these kinds of questions that are not always intuitive, not always clear just by thinking about it, you know, hmm, I wonder, but where you really need to get down to the numbers um, to answer that question. So we had the chance to do that for the New York City Health Department and a, a little bit for Department of Ed and City Hall as well. Um, and uh, we're now doing it more internationally, working with the World Health Organization, again, with some of these tricky questions, like where should countries that have limited amounts of COVID testing be using their tests right now? Got it. So I think the, the big question these days uh, in New York and beyond uh, in the U.S. is, uh, uh, let's say, vaccine safety, um, what constitutes herd immunity, maybe a, a quick definition of what that is for our audience, um, and whether or not we should still be wearing masks. Uh, let's start with uh, herd immunity. What is it and have we gotten it yet? Sure, so herd immunity is the point where enough people are immune that an epidemic cannot grow. 
So you can imagine an epidemic could be on an upslope and then hopefully at some point it turns the corner for a moment it's flat and then it starts declining again. Well, that, that moment when the epidemic is flat is the moment of herd immunity. And then you, you actually need to keep gaining immunity to then have it turn around and go down again. Um, and the, the level of the percent of people who need to be immune when you have herd immunity depends on how infectious the virus is, uh, the R number of the virus. That, that now, now everybody's grandmother, everybody knows what the R number is because of COVID. Um, well, that number depends on how contagious the disease is, um, you know, biologically. So you know, measles has a very high R number. It's extremely contagious. If you walk into a restaurant that somebody with measles was in recently, you could easily catch measles. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has a pretty high R number, a bit higher than seasonal flu, but not super high like measles. It also, of course, depends on our behavior and right? how contagious viruses are, depends on how much we go around breathing each other's particles or touching one another or, or uh, whatever it is, depending on how the virus transmits. And so that combination of things gives us the R number and the R number then determines what percent of us need to be immune in order to get to herd immunity. And with COVID-19, what would you say that, I mean, I've heard various estimates and they seem to vary a little bit. What, what what do you think is the current science in terms of what would constitute herd immunity, say, in New York City or New York State? Sure. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, based on how infectious the virus was, that herd immunity for us to behave normally the way we did before the pandemic, that level of contact, was around 65 to 75 percent. But unfortunately, the virus got smarter. The virus has actually mutated in ways that seem to let it transmit more readily. It increased its R number through mutations and getting better at transmitting in humans. And so now that estimate is closer to 80%, around about 80%. Got it. Got it. And wh where do we stand in New York City today with uh, the uh, rate of, uh, rate of uh, vaccine coverage uptake? So, you know, we're, I, I, I want to say we're somewhere near the 50 50 um, right now um, with New York City. We're, I think we're, we're getting past that metric now. And, um, you know, that's vaccination. We also have quite a bit of immunity because, unfortunately, people have caught COVID and have recovered um, and so have immunity from their disease. That's the kind of immunity we don't want to be getting, people getting sick, but, but that, that is another way that we get it. Um, you know, the other thing I mentioned that the R number depends on. Um, how biologically transmissible the virus is, as well as how we're all behaving. So right now in New York City, actually quite a lot of people are wearing masks. Quite a lot of people are still working from home if they can or avoiding um, certain, you know, uh, being around crowds. And so that's suppressing the R number. And that's why the virus is going down. It's also summertime. So people are spending more time outside. It's warmer. And that also is suppressing the R number. So that, that means that herd immunity in the summer might actually not be herd immunity in the winter next year. So we do need right. to keep increasing our immunity. So if we're at 50, we want to get to 80. Um, is it fair to say that that guidance um, ought to be wear a mask inside? You know, they're saying that if you're vaccinated right now, you can safely um, take your mask off inside. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think m many people that I know who are vaccinated keep wearing a mask because we all have a bunch of masks at this point and it's just a habit and you know, ha half of the people roughly that you will see outside are not vaccinated. So it just makes others more comfortable. Um, definitely, if you're unvaccinated at this point, you should still be wearing a mask when you're around other people inside. Great. So um, we're, we're, we're just out of time, but I, in 10 seconds or less, Vaccine safety, yes or no? Yes, the vaccines are extraordinarily safe. We have, uh, you know, it's unbelievable how much data we have now that the vaccines have been rolled out um, in great numbers. Uh, you know, the studies that uh, gave us the original approval of the vaccines were very large and really remarkable in the safety and efficacy. And now just so many people have had the vaccine that there's no question they're incredibly safe. I want to thank Dr. Anna Burstein for being a guest and providing some really great information on COVID. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, Anna will tell us a little bit about her life story, her academic journey that led her to uh, her great position at NYU. We'll be right back with Public Health America.
Welcome back to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. I'm very pleased to be here with Dr. Anna Berstein, uh, who is an assistant professor of population health at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. So, Anna, what we do on this uh, this segment of Public Health America is I've often believed that uh, that you know we see interviews like this all the time, the scientific aspect, and you you taught us a lot about COVID, which was great. But what people don't realize is sort of the, the behind the scenes story that enabled these incredibly smart people and scientists like yourself to kind of get to where they're at. And I'm trying to reach folks, you know, in the Bronx and throughout NYC and to convince as many high school kids as I can to go to college. I'm not saying that's the only ticket. I'm just saying that 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 it's one thing that brings that makes scientists sort of similar and sort of the trajectory that led them to get to where they are. So just to provide a little bit of backstory there. So Anna, tell us if you would, where uh, where did you start out? Where were you born? What were your formative years like? Sure, so I was born abroad. I was born in Kiev in what's now the capital of Ukraine. Then it was a uh, former Soviet Union. Um, and uh, you know, a, a big event in my life when I was a year and a half was the Chernobyl um, accident. And um, I lived there until I was uh, about four and a half. And then my family went through an immigration process and received asylum in the United States. So, uh, you know, spending time in a refugee camp, um, going through this whole uh, procedure, and then arriving in America where we were lucky to have an uncle um, of mine who, um, who we could stay with for a little while. Uh, we had $450. That was what our, our saved up rubles amounted to when we came. And uh, we were a family of four. I have an older brother. And um, I have to say, uh, really the big life lesson um, uh, for me was uh, my father um, had a professional experience in computers. Um, he worked on um, initially on machines that typeset newspapers. And then as um, you know, computing became more advanced throughout his life, he got really interested in computer science. Um, he earned an advanced degree in the USSR, not that his uh, you know, Russian Cyrillic documents meant a lot to employers in the United States, but he had these skills. You know, he didn't speak a lot of English. He uh, didn't, he had never lived in a capitalist system, right? Uh, he didn't, uh, he had to get used to the whole idea of, of, you know, saving money in a bank and, you know, different brands advertising to you and you have to choose <laughs> what to buy and all of these things were new. But science is universal, right? Math and science, no matter where you are, what you do, it makes sense. It's universal to anyone. And so, he landed in the San Francisco Bay Area in the Silicon Valley, and his skills were applicable immediately. I mean, he had a job. He, he hand wrote a resume <laughs> with what English he could put together. And with that handwritten resume that was passed around, he was able to find work really quickly. And he sort of, uh, you know, climbed the ranks of these companies. Um, he, uh, you know, we, we were sort of your American dream family. Um, my brother went to Stanford. I went to MIT. He ended up having a house and a car. And uh, you know, later I asked my father, what do you still hope to do in life? You know, what are your what are your big expectations? What's on your bucket list? And he, he told me honestly, his life has so surpassed any expectations that he ever had that he would own his own house and car, you know, rather than living in the one bedroom apartment with his kids and parents, you know, and um, that he would send his kids to these top notch universities that he didn't even know at this point what more he should expect out of life, just you know, the opportunities um, um, that we were so fortunate to have were so beyond what he could imagine um, in his own life growing up. So I definitely grew up with this um, incredible sense of what a privilege it is to be in America and also how powerful it is to build a foundation in something that is as universal as math or science. So I, I always gravitated toward that because I knew that no matter where in the world I ended up, no matter what my family was would face in the future, that that there would always be a role for a mathematician and a scientist, and that would transcend anything. Um, and so that's the direction sure. I took in my life. No, that's an extraordinary story, uh, and you certainly you covered a lot of ground and 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 the testimony to math and science and STEM education. Uh, could not be any clearer. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna slow us down just for a moment and focus on a couple of things because you really did cover a lot of ground. 
Um, how long were you in the refugee camp and where was that? Um, so we, we uh, our immigration path was through Austria where there was, um, and then Northern Italy. So that, that part of Europe. And um, we initially, there were some shelter like spaces where we could stay, but those filled up quickly. So after a period of time of staying there, we were given a small stipend and told to go find a place to stay. So um, I, I was, I don't remember this very clearly. I was um, just shy of five, but uh, my family rented a room um, in a house that other immigrants were renting and uh, we got the hallway of the house. So there were many families staying in this two bedroom home and our space was the hallway. So um, my, my mother managed to procure a table, like a dinner table that my, my brother um, could sleep on. And then the rest of us slept on the floor and all the other families that were staying in this house would just clamber over our sleeping bodies <laughs> anytime they had to go in and out when we were trying to sleep. So sure. that was their arrangement. Yeah, extraordinary. And then you, so you, you made your way to the States, landed in San Francisco with uh, a kind and helpful uncle. Uh, did you, when you began school in the U.S., public, private, what, what sort of school experience did you have? Yeah, we, so our first year, luckily, my parents were able to find a kindergarten through the local synagogue that had both Russian and English teachers because I didn't ah. speak any English at all. Sure. Um, and so that that was lucky. I got some language training there. And then I started first grade in the public schools. Um, and, you know, I did have that year of uh, bilingual education, but I still clearly remember the first day of class. Um, I, I clearly had no idea what was going on. The teacher handed out some worksheets and um, we, the child next to me started doing the worksheet and could see that I was completely lost and said, do you want to copy me? And I didn't know the word copy, but I knew the word coffee. So I was just <laughs> sitting there and thinking, what does it mean when someone says, do you want a coffee meal? <laughs> what on earth could he be trying to say? So it was, you know, it was a little hard to fit in in those early years, but we assimilated, Pe people adjust, it's what we do. And, uh, sure. yeah. and then you, so fast forward, you graduate high school, did you, did you go straight to MIT or what, what was your next step there? I did. I went to MIT for undergrad and grad school. Um, I I think I've just always had science, sort of a passion for science in me. So I, when I saw MIT, I just knew I'd found my people there. And, uh, you know, because it's expensive to go, I ended up um, sort of rushing through the undergrad classes and finishing in three years to not have to pay a fourth year of tuition and then just staying on for graduate school where they pay your tuition, which is great. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I had a wonderful time there. Um, there's just so much to explore in science. Um, I, uh, I really wanted at the time to build a very solid foundation across the disciplines of science because I love biology, I love chemistry, I love physics, I love math, I loved computers, I loved it all. And so um, I ended up just sort of flipping through the course catalog and asking what major would let me take courses in all of these things. And so, so I ended up choosing material science because uh, material science is sort of the chemistry of solid, hard things. And so there's a lot of physics and a lot of chemistry, but there's also a lot of biology because uh, things like joint implants and, and, and so on are based a lot on material science. And nowadays there's a lot of computation and math in every discipline. Um, so I, I, I enjoyed that field. And then uh, you know when it came time for me to choose a research project, I, I was just sort of wondering what was a big problem that I could work on? What, what are big problems in the world that are interesting and need to be solved? And at the same time, at that time in the early 2000s, it was clearly HIV AIDS, um, and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa where that pandemic was exploding. It was by far the leading cause of death and it was even causing some populations to start to contract. It was just you know, horrendous. And, and I thought, you know, that's clearly the biggest problem. Um, in front of me for, for my generation of scientists, what can I do there? So I, I worked uh, uh, in my PhD on vaccines, interestingly on the role of lipids in vaccines, which it, it's amazing to me now that we all know about lipids and vaccines um, um, in, in order to try to take a shot at goal for an AIDS vaccine. Um, and then as I was going through that, I started thinking more and more, what if, what if we don't succeed? in developing a vaccine for HIV AIDS, which so far nobody has, definitely worth continuing to try. But if that doesn't happen, can we still beat the pandemic somehow? And right. that led me to mathematical modeling, which is ways that you can think about 
um, different futures? And are, are there ways where it works out, where, where humans beat out this pandemic? Um, and, and that's been a tool that I've gotten to apply to tuberculosis, which is the biggest infectious killer in the world, um, uh, certainly pre-COVID year on year, um, and now COVID-19. Right. So MIT in three years, that's pretty remarkable in its own right. Were there faculty or, or, or folk during that era that were uh, critically helpful to you uh, in, in kind of um, defining your career and, uh, and helping you with your, your program of study? Sure. I, well, in part, I chose my major because there was this professor by the name of Don Sadaway who taught the introductory material science class to this enormous lecture hall of students. And you would show up in his class and you would you would feel like you should have had to buy tickets to get in. It was just so entertaining. He, he turned the class into a performance where you were just enthralled and entertained. And, and uh, he really treated it more like a performance than like, you know, with his back to you writing on the chalkboard type education. And I, I think that that really opened my eyes to how much joy there was in science and learning science and doing science. Um, you know, I also certainly clearly remember as a woman scientist, I clearly remember the first time I had a female professor teaching a class. Um, you know, it's something that we forget um, women and minorities or any field where um, there's not a lot of representation of a particular group that you know, the pe people in that group, they really feel it when finally they encounter someone else who looks like them. Um, who, who's in a position that they want to be in. It's, it's, a, it's a reminder that all kinds of diversity are really uh, key. Absolutely. And as we wind down, and a final question with just a few seconds, if you had to give one piece of advice to our audience out there, particularly young uh, high school students that are deciding whether or not college is the right path for them, what advice would you give? You know, I would say, you know, work on that foundation, build that foundation. And, you know, we've all had a bad year where we didn't, you know, we maybe missed something or, or now we feel a little bit intimidated by, maybe it's math, maybe it's history, whatever it is, that's kind of the thorn in our side topic. You know, it, it's not you, uh, you know, maybe you had a bad teacher, maybe you had a tough year, take the time to fill in that foundation. And then that is the foundation that you will leap off of into college and into your career. Anna, thank you so very much. And thank to our viewers for tuning in. Uh, it was great to chat with you, uh, to learn a little bit about COVID and to learn about your extraordinary journey and uh, your achievements. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. See you next time here on Public Health America.